Namaskar. Thank you for having me over here today. I'm Ram. I run an internationally acclaimed architectural firm back in Pune near Mumbai in India. We believe that we do architecture that is both socially and culturally relevant. Friends, I have never missed an opportunity to be in Kathmandu. I don't know why. There is something magnetic about this place and its people. I thank all the dignitaries sitting over here amongst whom there are policy makers, professionals, from academics, as well as people from the ministry, as well as various departments. And of course, some of you are from NGOs and owners of businesses. You see, housing is a very touchy sub subject. We all feel we are involved in one way or the other in this basic necessity of the human life. To me, a house for any common man and more so for people from the subcontinent who share a similar culture and whose roots of civilization are similar is not just a luxury but a place they call home a place that one sees generations of people growing up a place where their sorrows are distributed and their joys are shared where festivals are celebrated and culture is upheld so should i say with such strong emphasis that housing is my right yes i say it is damn well my right and to have a house ladies and gentlemen my topic is a far-fetched reality from what it is in the ground we have to redefine, redefine and change housing from a privilege to a right the reality is that about 80 percent of the people in most of the Sark nation's urban areas, even in Nepal, live in dwellings that are inhuman. Either their house is illegal structure, or it has no sewage systems, or no drinking water available, or it could be a structure that is too fragile to withstand an earthquake. This is a kind of homelessness, perhaps a disguised home ownership. This is a crisis and it is growing by three factors, mind you, three factors. People are moving from villages, from rural areas to urban areas and cities in search of the better life. They are moving in search of good education for their children. They are moving in search of better employment to feed their families. After all, haven't we all come to cities at some point in our lives to aspire for the good life? It is the cities that has help us live our aspirations. This has phenomenally increased the populations in the cities. Look at our cities. They are urban centers. They are urban centers that are choked by people. If you look at the population of Nepal from 1950s to now in 2018, there has been an increase of almost 20% in its urban population. And it will keep increasing as the time passes by. This is not just a problem in Nepal, it's a phenomenon in the entire Sark region. To make things worse, our healthcare greatly improved our lifespan. 50 years back, people used to live by uh, up to till 50. Today, people go even beyond 75. Thanks to modern medicine and great nutritive levels that we have today, that mo most of the people live beyond 75. With this background, should I say that housing is a right, but it is a big lie, especially amongst the economically weaker section people of the city, it's the economically weaker section people who bred the brunt of all the policies. The governments and various suppliers of housing have just been able to achieve a target of 40% in providing housing to the marginalized classes. No wonder our cities in the region give birth to slums. They give birth to massive slums and unorganized housing colonies where people live in subhuman conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that housing is a privilege, it is a privilege 
in fullest sense when it is a privilege it includes shelter from weather it provides security to homeowners has access to workplaces and the sources of livelihood it provides access to health care and education for human development not to mention access to portable drinking water working sewage system and solid waste disposal it has electric power strong drains street lights and a sense of belonging to the well-planned urban neighborhood. The private sector over the last 50 years in our region has only housed the rich and the upper middle class. We all know that very few in the subcontinent have this right. In fact, I would say it's a bundle of rights. It's like those who have, they keep getting more. If we want to be honest and fair, we need to redefine housing. Then work towards housing as a right. How can we do that? Stop thinking of making houses as products. Rethink housing as a process that involves the user groups who build their own houses and local authorities facilitating them. Get out of the mindset that architects, engineers, contractors, and developers create housing. They do not. They hardly touch 25% of the demand and that to only the upper and the middle income groups. Change your mindset and realize real people, real citizens and real families make their own houses. People build with their own hands. You see, I have purposefully put this photograph of a person who works in our company. His name is Sikara. His building is whole house. He works in our company in the housekeeping. When he wanted to build, we helped him buying the land. That inspired him to save a bit more of his salary. And then he was able to build his house incrementally. Perhaps the first pakka house in this remote village in Bihar he could build. This is a kind of a model that we all at our own level kind of you know encourage people to do that everything doesn't have to be done by the government itself we do have a role to play if you want to be honest professionals if you want to be like honest uh, change makers you have to be honest leaders then facilitate and enable what is already happening you have to ask yourself how can we facilitate the common man to build his own house well how about doing a land pooling and creating special habitat zones? What Professor Christopher Benninger in the morning session was proposing about. We have to create systems where financial institutions and governments encourage small manufacturers of building materials, suppliers of sand, suppliers of smaller, you know, like building materials which are very basic and essential. Can we also initiate, initiate short-term training courses that deepen building skills amongst the people who build with their own hands? Can we engage NGOs to recognize communities, to improve their homes? We must enable people to improve their skills that help them build their own houses. Way back in early 70s, Professor Benninger came out with an idea or a model, let's call it the site and services model. When he was a consultant to the World Bank and consulting for the Madras, Madras Metropolitan Regional Development Authority, where they came out with the idea that the land would belong to the government and the government will provide what individual people cannot provide for themselves, such as the land would be subdivided into certain kind of plots, then there will be streets laid out, infrastructure such as drainage, water and stream, storm water drainage systems, electrical lights would be put in place. Then these subdivided properties would be kind of sold to people to encourage their own building, uh, material, uh, build with their own hands. In this way, people have a sense of ownership and they will build their houses much more easily because what they can't build is they can't build streets they can't build strong drainage system they can't bring water supply they can't build 
you know, like uh, electric systems. We must do away with local government control regulations that make self-help housing illegal. Day in and day out, we notice that the authorities, they go on demolition drives. They, we see all the time these demolition drives taking place. Are these necessary if organized areas have been allocated to the migrant people to build their own houses? I don't think so. Friends, one of the most important part of housing is land. Let's not forget, land is very expensive. Even for me to buy land in urban areas is almost impossible. If government can facilitate giving land, then it will make a difference. Let the landowners come together. Let there be land pooling. And these enhanced properties be subdivided into smaller plots to be given over in some sort of you know, uh, price bracket to people who can build with their own hands. There should, they, these areas should also have good public uh, system, public transport system. Keep in mind, public transport is something which is an extremely important part of any kind of neighborhood. The, if there are public transport systems that are functional and efficient, people can travel or crisscross from one part of the city to another part to fetch their livelihood. There are ways and means by which we can transform housing from a privilege to a right. The last point I want to strongly make is do not give free housing, which is becoming a norm, especially for political gains. Many times these slum redevelopment projects fail to create humane habitats. They remain as slums that have left ground and reached the sky making them look like eyesores in the cityscape. We see them all over Mumbai. The worst is that many of these beneficiaries have rented out their slum redevelopment apartments to young professionals who want to be in the middle of the city and go back. they go back and settle down again in the slums. So we are really not solving the problem of the slums. We are recreating the problem again. Plus, the government is like bleeding money doing these kind of problems. The SRA schemes in Mumbai never met their targets. In the end, if we seriously have to solve this problem, I recommend you go dramatically into self-help housing, go dramatically into upgrading of existing housing. This can be done or this can be achieved by facilitating cheaper, and affordable building materials, allocating government lands, and properly planning services of the city. Thank you for listening to my point of view. My friends, let's build communities. Let's build an equal and happy society that our next generations would be proud of us, that we have left something for them to cherish for. Thank you very much.